Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here live at GBPC 2018 Global Blockchain Policy Conference here today and have invited someone very special from the Estonian Parliament, Mr. Paling. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> so, before the interview, how you like how you like in Korea so far? Oh, it's excellent. It's excellent. Weather is nice. The conference has been fruitful. A lot of interesting talks and, of course, the exciting, I mean, uh, all the legal framework around this um, uh, blockchain approach which is uh, taking place at the moment in the National Assembly and among the different uh, decision makers here. So when it comes to blockchain or digitized government, Estonia is leading the world. But that started with e-residency. So how did that all begin? Actually it started much, much more before. <laughs> it started already 27 years ago when we when we implement technology to every reform uh, we did and actually the e-governance boom uh, started in uh, in 2000. So uh, in uh, 2014 we realized that uh, we don't have to keep Estonia as a secret and we started to establish uh, and issue uh, e-residences for all the global citizens around the world and currently we have them more than 40,000 from uh, more than 140 different countries. So basically everybody could become an e-resident of Estonia, apply it, then we have these uh, procedures in our side and then it, the, you can use the access for the um, Estonian, um, let's say, e-governed uh, state as a platform. So getting a bit more specific, how would the process Know, of achieving e-residency in Estonia take place and how long would it take place? Achieving, uh, I mean issuing and, uh, and achieving for, a, for an applicant. Yes, yes. Usually it takes uh, two, uh, two weeks or something like that. So you basically you can apply it online, but you can, uh, you can get it from, uh, from the embassy or from the consulate. So basically you'll, you'll apply it. The Estonian government has a background search for the applicant and uh, then everything will be, will be done. So a lot of companies who are majoring in blockchain or cryptocurrency is moving their well, base country to Estonia and is establishing a blockchain related business in Estonia easier compared to other countries in the world? I mean, it's, it's easier to start business in Estonia than, uh, than probably anywhere else in the world because uh, I mean starting with a company it takes actually the record has been 18 minutes but uh, let's say in average it takes maybe one or two hours but basically I mean I think that this is attractive for the blockchain businesses and then cryptocurrency and businesses and ICOs as well that they know that Estonia is a tech savvy country and, uh, and in principle, uh, the decision makers as well want to find the solutions how to enable innovative services in our country. So, so this is probably the most important, let's say, uh, takeaway from, uh, from compared to many other countries because in, in some of the cases that we've seen is that, okay, they, they discovered blockchain and they, and they think that all the life, let's say, circles around the blockchain itself, but uh, actually the technology in a tech-savvy country uh, doesn't matter because technology is just, let's say, a, a, a solution and you'll have to choose what kind of approach to, uh, to use. But, uh, but the principle in automizing services, in making them, uh, let's say, hustle-free for the customer, this, this is important. So you're here in Korea today, and the Korean government is making huge efforts to work with the crypto blockchain industry itself. However, they recently announced a ban on ICOs. What's your take on that? I think it's, it's a bad idea to ban uh, services because, um, I mean, if somebody wants to, do, want, wants to do or has bad intentions, so they'll find the way to do it anyway. But uh, we've take, uh, we have taken the, that kind of approach that we, uh, we don't run to regulate all the services in the first day. So we let them operate uh, for a while and let's say study and learn together how to develop a good regulation behind it. I'm not saying that the regulation isn't needed, but without trying it actually, I think that uh, you, you don't find 
what could be the best solution. And then we, we did it uh, not in, in, in blockchain and crypto world, mm -hmm. but, but basically we did it um, uh, with, a, with a platform uh, like, like Uber. So where in most of the countries, uh, government said that though we have this taxi industry and, and we ban Uber, so we decided to embrace them and, and actually invited them to, to provide even, even more innovative uh, solutions and services. And currently um, it took maybe a bit more than one year uh, while, uh, while they were regulated. And we, we worked out this regulation together in all the sector so that the same thing could actually happen with blockchain and with cryptocurrencies as well and then maybe there should be even let's say this conventional banking sector involved to that because i mean all the regulation behind this kyc for the conventional banking is so hard and uh, and the commissions that the banks take from a let's say simple transactions they are so high uh, that, uh, but but the cost is because but of that's the, like eight to ten percent. It's eight to ten percent, but but it's not that it's their let's say good business. It's mm -hmm. it's also because of the hard regulation, because the current technologies and the current solutions they use, they uh, they need that kind of let's say efforts in terms of let's say human resources and bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. But blockchain could could make it so much easier. I mean the technology itself and. Uh, and then the banking could be uh, more accessible and, and uh, more hustle-free yeah, because we still have in Europe, in many countries, we have banking days where, mm -hmm. where uh, let's say, money doesn't move during the weekend or, or, or whatsoever. So it takes maybe 10 minutes from, uh, from one bank to another. So, but how could be, let's say, this uh, financial transactions and, I mean, making, an, making a transaction be uh, harder than s sending an email. Actually, it isn't in, in, in a technological basis. So here again, blockchain could be a good help. So blockchain tech, it's positive. It can make the world a much better place. However, when it comes to crypto, the public is divisive. When it, whether it's going to achieve mass adoption or not, people are not sure. However, from the perspective of the government, when people use crypto or make income by crypto, it could be hard to regulate them or per se tax them. How is the Estonian government taking approach on that and what's your personal perspective on that? Currently we, uh, we haven't regulated, uh, let's say, cryptocurrencies and ICOs uh, in a different way than we uh, regulate IPOs, for example. So basically, if it comes to the tax, we tax the income in the same way as, it, as it's taxed. Uh, uh, with the with the let's say conventional conventional <laughs> let's say uh, IPOs, uh, but uh, but basically uh, I think we all overestimate uh, what uh, people really want in terms of technology. People want let's say hassle-free and instant services with a good quality, and whether it is blockchain behind it, whether it is cryptocurrency behind it, whether it is something different, it doesn't matter. They want to I mean focus on the main thing. I mean. People usually don't have too much money and free time, so so the state's duty is to provide more free time and more money um, as income for, for the for the people. And uh, and if we focus too much on let's say f putting harder and harder regulation in in innovative services and also for the conventional services, then we just kill kill the sector itself and drown to bureaucracy. So moving on to the final question, when it comes to blockchain technology its applicability is expansive. It can disrupt basically almost every you know, uh, sector there is, industrial sector there is. So from the perspective of the Estonian government and as a member of the parliament, what do you prioritize? What's your priority? First of all, about this disruption, I think that we, uh, we usually overestimate the, uh, the impact, of, or impact of technology in a long-term perspective and underestimate it uh, Let's say uh, we uh, we overestimate uh, the let's say short-term perspective of the mm -hmm. development of technology and overestimate and underestimate the uh, long-term perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, the disruption will happen, but not uh, so soon as uh, as it's probably expected. And that's why I I invite all the let's say. Uh, um, participants in the economy to to consider these in innovative technologies to uh, to to provide the services or help to provide the services that they that they provide at the moment because otherwise there will there will be 
a huge competition and disruption. But currently, it's still uh, we are still in the phase where where these things and principles can be combined mm -hmm. uh, with each other. So the conventional sector could be m more efficient at a time where we put some, uh, let's say, uh, regulation for the innovation. So, so I mean, we, we all meet in the middle of the middle of the dance floor. So, <laughs> so, so basically, I think that this this is the solution. Not only this way that oh, here we have this totally disruptive services and then the other services doesn't change at all so we already see actually mm -hmm. the change in the in the conventional sectors as well and, and that's that's actually good and that's how the societies uh, should should work and that's why it is bad to ban uh, the the innovative services because it will postpone the development uh, for the conventional sectors as well and the let's say explosion in one day could be could be much harder than it would be uh, today if we could move, let's say, if we know what the vision is, the, what the direction is, where we are heading, and the aim to provide better services for the citizens and for the customers, that's the main aim. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, why, that's why we see so many new disruptive services, uh, let's say, scaling up uh, really fast, because it's long overdue that we still have to, I mean, contribute so much time uh, in, in banking and in financial sector as so, a customer. Actually, that was the last question, but uh, it just came up to my mind. Uh, there was a really interesting panel uh, question that was, as a policymaker, what is the most challenge that you receive, you know, taking part in the parliament? If you were to summarize it in one word or maybe a key, you know, words. Uh, I, I meet too often people who say no uh, uh, for innovation in, in a sense that I mean they, they always have an answer no it can't it can't be done of course most of the things can't be done in in day one but we we'll should fi we should find a solution how to make it happen and how to make it done instead of saying just no and we have something which is working already if we would have that principle I would have had that principle for I mean for the for the last decades, then we wouldn't have cars driving on the on the streets, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't have had industrial revolution and all that kind of stuff. So, currently, what's happening is 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 I think uh, as a societal change in the, in the societies, it's I mean comparable with the industrial revolution. So, a lot of people lose their job, but there will be even more jobs created, which means that a lot of people have to relearn. But nowadays uh, you'll, you'll have to be ready to relearn. So, so I think that this this worry around uh, um, around the topic that robots are going to take our job uh, jobs, and I mean, in, in if we use technology, then we need uh, less people. I think that expectation is wrong. At least for the next uh, couple of decades, we need uh, more people to do the ch same job that uh, has been done in the field of uh, in the field of technology as well. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Pelling. Thank you. Thank you for the interview. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. That was Mr. Pelling, the member of the Estonian Parliament. Thank you for watching.